Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. I would like to welcome everybody here to the restaurant Dapper's East on Addison Street in Chicago tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First off, we have two rules here. The first one is, and I'm sure all you know it, one fool at a time. And the second is no personal attacks. The college consists of the following format. We first have a brief announcements period, then our speaker will speak, then we will have a question and answer period, and after that we will have a infamous rebuttal period where you can say your piece about the speech or about anything else on your mind. Generally we have about a four minute rule on rebuttal period. Before we uh, announce Mr. Jonathan Barton, I think it would be apropos tonight to sing a little birthday song to Henry Thoreau. Oh. Come on, let's do it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Henry. Happy birthday to you. Let's introduce our main speaker, Mr. Jonathan Barton, with a rousing round of applause. You look a little like Henry. <laughs> no, that was a compliment. Good evening. What the Trump is up, College of Complexes. It's good to see you all on such a beautiful day, looking and sounding and dreaming as beautifully as you always do. Before I start, as always, I want to say how thankful and grateful I am to all the help of everyone here in preparing uh, for freedom of speech, whether it's just listening or participating by speaking. Thank you to all the freedom of speech advocates here tonight and those who couldn't make it but watch us on the web. Uh, I want to thank Tim and Charlie again this evening in the way that I always do, letting them know that this means something. Democracy means something, so I want them both to come up briefly. Come on, Charlie. For another sign of my appreciation for the work that they do, the unsung heroes of Freedom of Speech Forum, okay. College of Complex. Hey. Or, or I'll come to you. You don't need to come to me. No, let him come. Hey, look, if it's free. I, I want some cake now. It's free. Yeah, it's, it's harmless and it's free. Harmless. This is called Light Wing Smoke by Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> Light Wing. Hold up one of these so they can see what I'm breathing and looking at. Light wings, thank you. Light wing smoke, Icarian bird, melting thy pinions in thy upward flight. Lark without song and the messenger of dawn, circling above the hamlets as thy nest. Or else departing dream in shadowy form of midnight vision, gathering up thy skirt. By night star veiling and by day, darkening the light and blotting out the sun. Go thou my incense upward from this earth and ask the gods to pardon this clear flame. Thank you to Charlie and Tim. All right. Cool. Boy, Anyone's welcome to the College of Complexes, even a transcendentalist. <laughs> oh, and on a side note, we'd like to thank the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, Time Travel Department for their hard work and cooperation with the CDC's program to make the speaker available. <coughs> Entertainment for humanity, but not for our beast. Enter ye that have leisure and a quiet mind, who earnestly seek the right road. <clears throat> when I wrote the following pages, or rather the bulk of them, I lived alone in the woods, a mile from any neighbor, in a house which I had built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts and earn my living by the labor of my hands only. And uh, 
I'd like to uh, quote something by Slim Brundage that says sort of similar the same thing. Slim once said, let me give thanks that I have been a jailbird, beatnik, hungry bum, and underprivileged kid. Also that I have worked with my hands most of my life. That's the way most of the world lives. So uh, they both have something in common. And I know that that sounds like exaggeration, but I'll, I'll show you this evening and illustrate how uh, they're kindred spirits. And when you talk about Henry David Thoreau, you're talking about slim brundage, whether you realize it or not, and vice versa. This is from a week on the Concord in Merrimack Rivers. Eggs. I lately met with an old volume from a London bookshop containing the Greek minor poets, and it was a pleasure to read once more only the words. They live not in vain. We can converse with these bodiless fames without reserve or personality. I know of no studies so composing as those of the classical scholar. When we have sat down to read them, life seems as still and serene as if it were very far off. And I believe it is not habitually seen from any common platform. So truly and unexaggerated as in the light of literature. In serene hours, we contemplate the tour of the Greek and Latin authors with more pleasure than the traveler does the fairest scenery of Greece or Italy. Where shall we find a more refined society? Reading the classics or conversing with those old Greeks and old Latins in their surviving works is like walking amid the stars and constellations. A high and by, way serene to travel. There is something strangely modern. Odes like gems of pure ivory, they possess an ethereal and evanescent beauty like summer evenings, which you must perceive with the flower of the mind and show how slight a beauty could be expressed. You have to consider them as the stars of lesser magnitude with the side of the eye and look aside from them to behold them. They charm us by their serenity and freedom from exaggeration and passion and by a certain flower-like beauty which does not propose itself but must be approached and studied like a natural object. Perhaps their chief merit consists in the lightness and yet security of their tread. These are some of the best that have come down to us. And Thoreau's really in a league uh, very few. He's one of the best. Uh, the Transcendentalists, uh, Margaret Fuller, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Bronson Alcott, um, Ellery Channing, Theodore Parker, to name a few. Excuse me, Bob. Um, can you please summarize what you, um, why you read those two quotes from Thoreau? What, uh, what yeah. do you like about him? Yeah, he's got so many hats. You know, he's a surveyor, he's a teacher, he's a translator, he's a farmer, he's a botanist, he's a historian, he's a poet, uh, he's a spiritual seeker, and uh, he's a transcendentalist. What's so great about him is he's translating, he's poetizing, is that the word? Rick Lewis. And he's mapping out not only nature, not only history, not only dreams, but the future, grassroots democracy. And a lot of times when people call him an eccentric, um, I hesitate to uh, correct them because I know it's evident if you read enough of his work that he's, he's like somebody on the side of a tree, right? This is the best way I can describe it. And if you're on the north side of the tree and everybody's on the south side of the tree, you think, well, where is this person? You know, but they can hear you, so they know you're somewhere around the tree. Or if they're on the east side of the tree and you're on the west side of the tree, they can't really see you, so they can't fully grasp and understand what you're all trying to go for, you know, in your uh, endeavors in life, whatever they may be in whatever profession. Well, 
Thoreau isn't always on the other side of the tree when the community is there. He's climbing up the tree, and he's always trying to climb the highest tree. So he always gets himself in trouble of being not misunderstood, but always being labeled these things like an eccentric or a free thinker, or all these things. I think he's just a human being that refused to settle for anything less than his absolute best. He wants to be not just a an American being. He wants to be better than. That. He wants to be a human being, and he doesn't settle for just being a human being, he wants to be a living being, and, you know, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, he wants to be a cosmic being. And I love that about everything that he's written. And, you know, I'll just read some of the things that I think speak to that point. Okay, thanks, well. As surely as the sun set, and thank you for the question. As surely as the sunset in my latest November shall translate me to the ethereal world and remind me of the ruddy morning of youth, as surely as the last strain of music which falls on my fading ear shall make age to be forgotten or in short the influences of nature survive during the term of our natural life, so surely that my friend shall forever be my friend and reflect a ray of God to us and time shall foster and adorn and consecrate our friendship, no less than the ruins of temples. As I love nature, as I love singing birds, and gleaning stubble and flowing rivers, and morning and evening and summer and winter, I love thee, my friends. And so it was with the profoundest expression of love that I now present to you, my dear friends, <laughs> my close confidants, my fellow earthlings, my complexity collegians, a public service announcement by none other than the legendary journalist, Howard Beale. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Excuse my language. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troop of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. So if you want the truth, go to God. Go to your gurus. Go to yourselves. That's the only place you're ever going to find any real truth. <laughs> but man, you're never going to get any truth from us. We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. We tell you that a Kojak always gets the killer. And that nobody ever gets cancer in Archie Bunker's house. And no matter how much trouble the hero is in, don't worry, just look at your watch and at the end of the hour, he's going to win. We'll tell you any S-H-I-T you want to hear. I know this is a family restaurant. <laughs> if we were still at the Lincoln office. We deal in illusion, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds, we're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions. We're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tomb is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You eat like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. So turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. Turn them off right now. Turn them off and leave them off. Turn them off right in the middle of the sentence I'm speaking to you now. Turn them off. Give a chance. If Henry David Thoreau uh, were here today, I think that would be his favorite journalist. A fictional character. Hello in a movie approximately 40 years ago, probably longer than that. But I still think it's the most current film I've ever seen on the topic of last week, fake news. Uh, Henry David Thoreau challenges us all 
to know that the future is waiting for us to be our best. His life is one deeply in tune with everything and everyone he sees and hears. To Thoreau, all the world is a wonder. Endless inspiration to dream and to speak and to write and to live stems from all that life shares for us all to witness. He's genuinely living in the moment. He's one that not only affirms civil liberties of we the people as well as the powerful beauty of the environment, but something very elusive and fragile and absolutely necessary to the survival of the human species. A balanced, shared relationship between we living beings who are people and Mother Earth living being who is the planet. A bond that's so vital that we have just barely begun to understand the importance of the precarious spot we currently find ourselves in. We must now wisely step on the brakes of material growth for growth's sake. Rapidly evolve beyond market madness fueled overdevelopment. To wake up from the myths which all our lives have declared that short-sighted arms proliferation makes our communities safe. It's time to allow for more open spaces, more green spaces, more wild spaces, and not just physical spaces, spiritual spaces, intellectual spaces, community, and verbal. And that's a specific tip of the hat to the brilliant college of complexes and other free speech and forums like it. These spaces are powerfully influencing our lives today more than ever. And that is why we demand a democratic internet. It's time for more renewable energy and a free press and a fully funded public libraries and schools and the right to assemble and voice our dissent. Community gardens, sustainable agriculture, public parks and fields where we can gather any day of the year for us to at least reach a victory cultivated by spiritual growth and enlightenment and coexistence. Henry David Thoreau welcomes us to dive into the day and to fully express ourselves, to fearlessly build our imaginations, to fully embrace that which is sacred within us all. No matter how much from time to time we might doubt that it is there, that self-generated little spark that is there for each and every one of us whenever and wherever we search for it, our voices. Now, he really was on his very own dream, his own cloud, his original trek. Nothing was going to steer him in a direction astray from wherever the muse was leading him. He didn't mind being in the company of Earth. He didn't mind facing himself and being confronted with the challenges of time, and the cold and warmth of the seasons, and limitations of living simply. What he discovered was that time is like an unending number of seeds planted in all of our experiences in life. What we contribute to each moment and what we commit to memory about our experiences gives a genuine foundation to freedom. Maybe not always the freedom we feel that we deserve, but definitely the freedom to which we have sacrificed and studied and over time made a solid vow to improve ourselves for it. Especially on the 4th of July week, I think it's important to talk about uh, being first and foremost a living being, a human being, and then an American, and then an Illinoisy, if that's a word. <laughs> this phrase, this kind of curious phrase, I don't know where it started or how it's been interpreted over the years, and the decades and the centuries, but you all know this phrase, love it or Thank you. We know this phrase, especially on 4th of July week. Love it or leave it. Now, what does that mean? Let's, let's deconstruct that sentence. I think Thoreau would have a lot to say about this, you know, five-word sentence in 2017. Throughout the history of the United States, we the people have always declared, love it when it is lovable. 
like it when it is likable. Constructively criticize it when it is mildly disappointing. Protest it when it is a failure of leadership by some. Mass protest it when it is a failure of leadership by some or by many. Wage evolution when it is treasonous by some. Wage a combination of evolution and revolution when it is treasonous by many. And wage revolution when it is extinctionist. I don't know if that's a word, but we just invented a word tonight in College of Complexes. We often do that. Extinctionist. Consult me afterwards for the exact spelling. In all examples, there is a consistent balance between system volution and self volution occurring because we genuinely do love Earth. And that love is in everything that we can read from the life's work of Henry David Thoreau and all the transcendentalists. Not just Henry David Thoreau, but all. Thank you. I went to this used bookstore one day when I was, you know, just walking, just sauntering, as Henry David Thoreau uh, affectionately calls it. He was. He's always talking about sauntering, and I love it how he uses that word, because he makes it sound like he's not walking on the earth. Excuse me? The Rose Sauntering Society t-shirts. I'd buy that off of you right now if I wasn't broker than broker. <laughs> I bought it at Concord. Well, we should all go to Concord. Let's get a bus. Can, can we get a, a, a pool of money together and get the whole college to go to Concord this week? At least this year. Um, sauntering. You know, you're walking with the earth, not on the earth. Not at the expense of Mother Earth. You're walking with the earth. It's a mutual relationship. It's a sharing experience where uh, nobody's getting over on another person. You're both learning from each other. You're both growing from each other. You're both strengthening the best within you. And I just want to illustrate. Excuse me, I'm sorry. There's a short quote from Thoreau on saunter. And it goes, it is a great art to saunter. <laughs> Thank you. It is a great art to saunter. How many people sauntered today? Did anyone saunter? How do you define that? Good question. How do you define that? Each one of us has our own definition, and that's the beautiful thing about sauntering. So picture in your minds, on one evening, you have a strange emotional experience in your sleep when a, a deep clear vision occurs of your best night dream or your worst day mirror simultaneously and they are both uh, there and you can in this bizarre vision see their souls the very essence of who they both are and Both are well known, both of the earth, both out of paper. This is a book from 1898. I got it at that used bookstore in Oak Park when I was sauntering one day. And here's Mr. Mister, we all know him. Both have extraordinary influence, and just for affection's sake, let's nickname this uh, 1998 copy of Walden, uh, Bernie, and this is Mr. Mister. Both have extraordinary influence on our everyday lives, but Bernie gives so much back that it takes, while Mr. Mister only remembers the motto, more, more, more. <laughs> Bernie, on the other hand, uh, when well-written, teaches us how to live, how to love, how to care. While on the uh, other side of the sky, the kind of gray side, Mr. Mister normalizes theft and murder and pollution. Now on the bright side of the sky, the sunny side, Bernie is the blooming of our minds. And on the cold side of the sky, Mr. Mister is the symbol of our fears. 
Bernie is the measure of our path we choose in order to evolve into a civilization. On the grace, rainy side, Mr. Mister is the mirage which is vomited up from the crime of slavery. Bernie is a unity of pages, ink, and pure expression. Mr. Mister is the unofficial business card of divide and conquer. Bernie, when you read it, your spirit is reborn. When you read Mr. Mister, you soon get very bored. Bernie is countless we deas whose times are finally now. Mr. Mister is just one idea whose time has long since been over. And so it is Mr. Mister or Bernie, that's the choice. And Thoreau talks about this over and over and over again in Life Without Principle, which originally was going to be titled, What Shall It Profit? You know, he's going right at the heart of what Marx and Engels are talking about. We often don't like to talk about this as Americans because we want him to be that family friendly on the weekend, great guy who, he's not on Mount, Mount, Mount Rushmore, but you know, let's water him down to his most non-threatening self, you know. Walden, but not civil disobedience. Weak on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, but not plea for John Brown or life of John Brown. Which represents our vision for the future of our human community? Is it, it's your choice and yours alone. I'm not here to coerce anybody, I'm just attempting to illustrate that the stakes have never been higher. For everything there's a season. There are so many things we thank him for. You know, many people throughout history who have been inspired, empowered, awakened, and energized by his work were grateful for the founding fathers and founding mothers of the great military victories for liberty in the history of the United States. And tonight we're going to thank someone who is one to remember because of a different noteworthy title. Founding publisher, founding writer, founding printer, founding artist, founding librarian, founding teacher, founding historian, founding journalist, founding reader, founding translator, speaker, dreamer, ecologist, gardener, construction worker, architect, founding manufacturer. His family built pencils. We have a lot of pencils in the back. Take one. I don't want to have any pencils left with me. We got plenty of paper too. Founding harmonizer, founding author, founding dissident, founding philosopher, founding Transcendentalist. Henry David Thoreau, one of many who are not praised or is often remembered, not given a remembrance every year, which illustrates how crucial their contrib contributions were to the development of the countless intellectual, artistic, social, and civic tools we are so accustomed to using in the world today. They are the unsung peoples of a very different yet just as significant progress. They live not in vain, to use a line from a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. Coke. <laughs> Thank you. Now he showcases his earth as the most interesting voice to listen to, its teachings the most beautiful vision to adore, and its natural history is the most spiritually significant statements on what is the real wealth, the real fame, the real accolades of anything he has witnessed. Earth, at least in the life of Henry David Thoreau, is presented with this rare honor, a fellow living being, to be highly respected and listened to, and by all means nurtured and protected. He describes every experience, every location, place of nature, every idea, every reflection, every dream, every progression with painstaking details and untiring commitment to set the scene for us, the readers, 
so that we can clearly imagine what it's like to be there ourselves. Earth, democracy, people, especially people. He inspired Dr. Martin Luther King and many others in the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. He inspired Leo Tolstoy. He inspired Mahatma Gandhi. He inspired the White Rose Movement in their struggle against fascism during World War II. He inspired the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Henry David Thoreau, in his 200th birthday year, seems to be everywhere. <coughs> except Washington, D.C. <laughs> this is a picture a couple years ago. A man was um, murdered at gunpoint by some police officers in Louisiana, father of five, unarmed just going about his business. Uh, individual in the community of great dignity. His name is Alton Sterling. And this uh, young woman decided to participate in a peaceful democratic demonstration to say that we aren't target practice. This is not a shooting gallery. This is the United States of America. Now, Thank you. what is wrong with the country when that's the response from the state no to someone who is clearly peaceful and democratic, unarmed, could not have more dignity in their person in that moment to express enough? Those are our tax dollars that are used to make these brave gentlemen and gentlewomen the pawns, the minions, the lackeys, the flunkies, the toadies of the state, which constantly tells us that we should be on notice that there's always something possibly criminal about peaceful and democratic assembly. I think Henry David Thoreau would have something to say about that. In fact, we know that he would have something to say about that. Because he wrote it in jail after being in jail for protesting the Mexican War and a state that condones slavery in civil disobedience. I wonder what Henry David Thoreau would think about how the United States government treats people who tell the people what are tax dollars and our time and our trust are going towards other than democracy, other than workers' rights, other than the environment and climate change, renewable energy, Green New Deal that has not happened that must happen. I wonder what Henry David Thoreau would say about that. Hear no reproach in nature. What are these pines and these birds about? What is this pond a doing? I must know a little more and be forever ready. There could not be three more significant words in everything in his works that I'm really trying to read up on as much as I can the last four months to bring him here tonight. Be forever ready. If you write one thing down with those pencils and on a piece of paper, we got plenty of paper here. We got paper and pencils for Henry David Thoreau's 200th birthday uh, t today, or this Wednesday. Be forever ready. Be forever ready to be peacefully defiant, democratically opposed to criminals in high places that think because they have the budgets and the microphones and the fancy titles and the entourages that they are more important than us, than you, than all of us. 
Instead of singing as the birds, I silently smile at my incessant good fortune. But I don't know that I bear any flowers or fruits. Methinks, and he uses this phrase all the time, methinks, and I love it when he uses methinks. Methinks, if they try me by their standards, I shall not be found wanting. I think I have this advantage in my present mode of life over those who are obliged to look abroad for amusement, to theaters and society, that my life itself is my amusement and never ceases to be novel, the commencement of an experiment or drama which will never end. <coughs> Democracy is an experiment. It's not a microwave dinner that we know for certainty what's going to happen in four and a half, five and a half minutes. It's an experiment. We don't know what's going to happen when everybody peacefully and democratically shows up for a block party, for a picnic, for a barbecue, for a family reunion, for a music. We don't know what's going to happen. We know what happens when everybody shows up for the baseball team winning the World Series, which is a beautiful thing. But that's just the tip of the iceberg of what can happen. He's always talking about our capacity, building our capacity. That's the greatness of Henry David Thoreau. He doesn't settle. He doesn't believe it when the critics say, well done. He says, well, well done yesterday, but what am I doing today to improve myself? Well done last week, last year. Here, here, hats off to Henry David Thoreau for that. He was not a wealthy man. He often had to sleep in the attic of his parents' house, where he had to borrow some land from a great friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and build a small cabin on Walden Pond between 1845 and 1847 for two years, two months, and two days. He officially moved in there, actually, July 4th, 1845. I have learned that if one advances confidently in the direction of one's dreams and endeavors to live the life one has imagined, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Confidence is one thing I, myself, am so grateful for teaching me to Henry David Thoreau. To have confidence when you think you don't, to have the capacity to grow your confidence when you don't think that you can. Someone who needed a lot of confidence building was someone by the name of Mario Savio. He had a disability which was a speech disability. It was very, very, a huge mountain for him to climb to go before a public square, a, com a public um, meeting space, a public commons, and speak out because he knew that that speech disability would make him noticed. He would be someone who would stand out more. He would be someone who was labeled eccentric or different, just like Henry David Thoreau. This is what Mario Savo said on December 2nd, 1964. And there's more about Mario in the packet, and I encourage you all to get the packet if you didn't get one. Uh, there's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious <laughs> makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part. And those of you who have heard my rebuttals know I could do this a lot more fiery with the best of them, but I don't want to yell this, I want to share this. You can't even passively take part, and you got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you got to make it stop, and you got to indicate to the people who run it and to the people who own it, unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. This is one of the most iconic images from the anti-Vietnam War movement. And in 2003, I went to Washington, D.C. with many of my brothers and sisters to protest yet another war. <laughs> yet another example of madness. And it just says it all. Life in the form of just one fragile yet powerful flower showing what Earth can create at its best when we are united and not divided from each other. No matter what our ideology, our race, our economic income, our religious beliefs, our non-beliefs, our languages. War is not healthy for children and other living things. Amen to that.
Our village life would be stagnant if it were not for the unexplored forests and meadows which surround it. We need the tonic of wildness to wade sometimes in marshes where the bittern and the meadow henlark and hear the booming of the snipe to smell the whispering sedge where only some wilder and more solitary fowl builds its nest and the mink crawls with its belly close to the ground. At the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable, that land and sea be infinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed by us because unfathomable, fathomable, a difficult word. We can never have enough of nature. Here's a poem that he wrote. Direct your eye right inward and you'll find a thousand regions in your mind, yet undiscovered travel them and be expert in home cosmography. You know, this guy is like John Lennon and Paul McCartney. <laughs> you know, if he were alive today, he'd be with a guitar or a piano or drums or a bass or... You know, he'd, he'd be in one of those, those circles of people who was constantly artistically expressing himself. I have no doubt of that. You know, you can call him a troubadour, a trailblazer, he's just undefinable. The labels don't stick with this guy, and that's why we love him. To be awake is to be alive. I've never yet met someone who was quite awake. How could I have looked them in the face? We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn, which does not forsake us in our soundest sleep. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability for us to elevate our lives by conscious endeavors. It is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue and so to make a few objects beautiful, but it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look, which morally we can do to affect the quality of the day that is the highest of arts. Every one of us is tasked to make our lives, even in their details, worthy of the contemplation of our most elevated and critical hour. If we refused, or rather used up, such paltry information as we get, the oracles would distinctly inform us how this might be done. I would not subtract anything from the praise that is due to philanthropy, but merely demand justice for all by their lives and works are a blessing to mankind. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live and could not spare any more time for that one. The surface of the earth is soft and impressionable by the feet of human beings and so with the paths which the mind travels. How worn and dusty then must be the highways of the world. How deep the ruts of tradition and conformity. I did not wish to take a cabin passage but rather to go before the mast and on the deck of the world, for there I could best see the moonlight amid the mountains. I do not wish to go below now. Writing is like a communication bridge of everything one can dream all in one. Writing connects with everyone, everywhere, who understands and guides us towards understanding. 
Writing is always alive with ideas, endless ideas. I used to think that when I write, I am writing to lots of people who I had yet to meet, or maybe not just people in the distant future, but spirits of people. The feeling of not only people, but spirits of everything on earth. Animals, nature, water, vegetables, fruits, spirits of plants, forests, valleys, deserts, ice cliffs, mountains, beaches, prairies, rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, spirits of entire oceans. Writing is a way of expressing what each journey of the soul has brought back home. In the best moments of our imaginations, travels across the communication bridge, we discover that although our bodies grow older, our souls grow younger and fearless, teaching us intuitively to be resolute in our vow to listen to our souls, to reflect and to build on something so startling to us. When it first happens, we sometimes dare not even remember it, sometimes dare not even write about it, but it's there, always there with us. The future remembers us. And when we choose to remember it, no matter how unpopular it may be to do so, we reach another milestone towards achieving a life which is transcendental. Not only does the future remember us, it roots for us. It prays for us. It needs us to do our very best. Thoreau demanded excellence from his life, from his books, his essays, his journals, his teaching, his surveying, his botany, his collecting of indigenous American artifacts and birds' nests, his sketches. He lived according to the value, be forever ready. Writing is our map to places in the soul which has not yet been named. once wrote on his guitar, this machine kills fascists. Now that's a shocking thing to conjure, that a guitar could kill fascism. I think Henry David Thoreau, uh, if he had a quote on one of his notebooks or pencils, would write, these meadows bloom freedom. Because you really know what freedom is when you're that close to a revolution in the 1770s in Concord, Massachusetts. This is a poem for all those lost souls who we take for granted real democracy, that their blood paid for us to enjoy. I'm a non-disabled white male suburban American. No one has had an easier life in the history of this planet than me, and I realize that. And that's why I thank them every day, even if it's just through freedom of speech and poetry, and going to bookstores that aren't the big name. If we could hear from those who died in the last unjust war waged, it would be so clear to us why there is another way. If we could hear those voices cry, we'd recognize our mistakes, see those tears pour out their eyes, saying peace is the only way. In your packet is a copy of Civil Disobedience. Henry David Thoreau demands in Civil Disobedience that we be first and foremost united as human beings on the planet that we call home, Mother Earth. During the 1930s and 1940s, it would be ridiculous to hear a government say, that out-of-control totalitarian regime is not a major concern, it's a non-issue. We wouldn't have tolerated it. We knew that fascism had to end, whether we had to sacrifice ourselves to end it or someone else did. Why are we told day after day 
that climate change is a non-issue and not the most important priority of our lives. Why? Are they that proud? Is there that much wealth and profit to be gained? I brought a packet in the bag. I didn't put it in the folder because it's too big. Debunking all the myths of climate change. It's in the back behind that little table. Get that debunking the myths of climate change. And I know y'all here tonight don't need it. But if you have someone who's watched too much of the propaganda networks, corporate media, just make a photocopy for them and give it to them. That's the most respectful thing you can do is say, I respectfully disagree and hear my facts of science. And he talked about science a lot too. This is from a week on Concord and Mary Mac Weaver's Wednesday chapter. My love must be as free as is the eagle's wing hovering over land and sea mid everything. I must not dim my eye in thy saloon. I must not leave my sky and nightly moon. Be not the fowler's net which stays my flight and craftily is set to allure the sight. But be the favoring gale that bears me on and still doth fill my sail when thou art gone. I cannot leave my sky for thy caprice. True love world soars high as heaven is, an eagle would not broke her mate thus one who trained his eye to look beneath the sun. Nature doth have her dawn each day, but mine are far between. Content I cry for sooth to save, my brightest are I ween. For when my sun doth deign to rise, though it be her noon tide, her fairest field in shadow lies, nor can my light abide. Sometimes I bask me in her day, conversing with my mate, but if we interchange one ray, forth with her heats abate. Through the, his discourse I climb and see as from some eastern hill, a brighter moral rise to me than lieth in her skill. As were two summer days in one, two Sundays come together, our rays united make one sun with fairest summer weather. I love it when he talks about flowers, no. when he talks about freedom, independence, honesty, patience, justice, his brother, sauntering, animals, seasons, government, good government, bad government. I love it when he talks about government. To me, when he talks about civics, it's not some boring thing. It's civics. It's a living entity. Wisdom, intelligence. He talks about taxes, the kindness of strangers. There was some really good kindness to strangers in Concord, Massachusetts in the 1800s. Self-reliance, conscience, rivers, lakes, plants, will of the wisp. He talked about jail. He talked about conscience. He talked about pencils and notebooks, music, writing, traveling, rainbows, business, construction, mountains, history, boats, trains, stars, privacy. He talked about loss and education and reading and being awake. He talked about God and faith. He talked about the ocean, friendship, skies, slavery, the Underground Railroad, which his family participated in with a quiet dignity that we continue to just be just in awe of. He talked about slavery. He talked about the woods. He talked about our beloved United States of America. He talked about farming. He talked about the indigenous American community, the first nation. It's going to be a test later. He talked about the heaven or Elysium fields. I love that term, Elysium fields. He talked about the cosmos. He was once nicknamed by an author, the Cosmic Yankee. I like that. I'm going to give a talk about Russia. He talked about John later, Brown, later the, the universe, democracy. And with my he talked about we the people. He talked about soul. Be forever ready. Henry David Thoreau, happy 200th birthday. All right. It's now time to take questions. Can you handle it yourself or do you need Andy to moderate? I can handle it. Okay. First, I love Andy's moderating. 
first first question for me. Um, what would Henry Thoreau think of today's climate of globalization and the spread of capitalism? Well, there are so many different forms of the PR of capitalism that I just get lost in the vortex of it all. I think he would think that on paper it sounds like a great idea, but you know what Gandhi said about Western civilization. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with capitalists when they talk about capitalism in the abstract, but when I see it play out, when I see a Holman Square, for example, in the Chicago, uh, beloved Chicago, a torture chamber. Let's let's not water this down. We're in that city where there was a torture chamber where people couldn't see their lawyer because they were just picked up off the street, just like if they were picked up in Afghanistan or Iraq. It's the cops, not capitalism. Yeah. You know, if there's money to be made off something, capitalism will say, "Well, I don't, I don't judge how that money's made. There's money to be made, and that's a problem." You know, the abstract and what we see played out are two different things. But again, I don't think totalitarian communism is the answer to capitalism. I think democracy is the answer to capitalism. And that's why I don't paint Thoreau in a left or right corner. He is a bridge builder. He's the perfect person to talk about on the 4th of July because he cares about justice and democracy and people. He does not want you know, people hijacking our government from us. And they happen to be the robber barons all the time. You know, Goldman Sachs gets the longest meeting and the first meeting and the most meetings. And that's not the way we operate. I don't say to you or you or you, I'm going to talk to you because you got a million dollars today to talk to me. That's ridiculous. That's not democracy. And Henry David Thoreau, in Life Without Principle, the life of John Brown, plea for John Brown and civil disobedience goes over point for point how at the inception of this country, slavery and the genocide of Native American peoples and the subjugation of people with disabilities and women and intellectuals and artists and dissidents just created this undercurrent of, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's a great, great, country because we have the capacity to be democracy, but we aren't exercising it right now. Okay. That's for sure. But uh, uh, Thoreau was well known for his views on simplicity, especially at Walden, but you hardly mentioned anything about that. Well, could you summarize his views on living a simple life? <laughs> well, I mean, there's just so much you can't cover in 45 minutes. <laughs> I know, I went over. Uh, I brought the book to read it and then to have people come back in the next couple, upcoming weeks and months and let's talk about the book and before the, you know, college starts and after. Uh, it's a mountain of brilliant, you know, writing and philosophizing and spiritualizing and he's... He's, he's just always honing his skills. He doesn't settle. If he knows he can run that mile a second faster tomorrow, well, he doesn't want to wait until tomorrow. He wants to run that mile a second faster today in everything that he's doing. So I just, I cannot overemphasize this. Is, this is not, you know, uh, trying to build him up to be something that he's not. He's, but what did he say about simplicity, I asked you? Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Well, I know that. But, uh, anything more than that? <laughs> uh, most of his book was on that, or looking for that. And he found it. He, he, he rose above materialism, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, if the house was just a little tiny cabin in the woods, that was enough for him. There was a pasture enough for his imagination, I believe he wrote once, which is one of my favorite passages. Because as a young person who grew up in the country, there were a lot of pastures and a lot of cows and buffalo and horses where I was. And I didn't realize until, you know, 20 years later, people didn't grow up in that. They didn't have that freedom to run without worrying about getting hit by a car or hit by a bullet. There was pasture enough for his imagination. So, I mean, simplicity in the way he describes it is a simplicity with a stability around it. So it's it's a very complex thing what he's talking about, but it's a very beautiful thing when people commit towards 
it in mass. So simplicity is at the heart of what he's talking about when, when, when he wants to uh, become free from materialism. Did uh, Thoreau get some of his ideas? Or Tim? <clears throat> Did Thoreau get some of his ideas with the Indians, or did he have anything to do with the Indians about their uh, way of life and things of that nature? Yes, he was very much learning as much as he could in Massachusetts about uh, the indigenous community and the First Nation. Uh, peoples uh, as much as you could because there were so few left in Massachusetts. Uh, he collected as much as he could from spiritual teachings and artistic artifacts that he found. I think this is one of the things that at that time you could search through the woods and find a whole lot of stuff that you just can't find now because it's so overdeveloped. There aren't acres and acres of space to search through that's untouched. So, I mean, he, he could see that there was a, a reckoning coming with how this nation was formed, and it was a problem from hell. You know, he, he described it very well. Over here. Uh, Thoreau said he was incapable of being stimulated by human, human company. He preferred squirrels? I mean, what is this? He's supposed to be great? One of the misperceptions is he was uh, uh, antisocial or he liked to be alone. He was a writer, so he, he really needed his peace and quiet for a few hours every day. He needed to, a few hours every day to walk. He walked almost two or three hours almost every day, unless in those days that his tuberculosis really acted up. So, I mean, this, this was a guy who was active. I mean, he was a go-getter. Um, yeah, he saw human beings as highly, highly valuable to have relationships, but he didn't see it less valuable to have a relationship with uh, fellow living being Earth. And I think that's the thing that sets him apart. He, he sees the greatness in human beings and the greatness in planets. I mean, he is, you know, the cosmic Yankee. <laughs> he's, 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 you know, he's, it seems like he's like this flake, right? Sometimes, like he's, he's thinking, oh, eventually we're going to fly to other planets and explore other worlds because science is eventually research and development, which is a thing that's being underfunded right now under current uh, administration leadership, if we could call it that. You know, he, he believed that greatness was constantly, you know, not too far off. He, he believed that miracles were possible, you know, so uh, he had a respect for all living things. What does that word mean, transcendence? What does that mean? Rising above the constraints of materialism, rising above the constraints of our wants and meeting the commitment to our needs, especially the needs of solidarity. Like let's say I want four cars and two houses, but you need single payer health care. Well, am I being reasonable or unreasonable? I say, well, you know, I've earned those four cars and those two houses. <laughs> you know. Not to put down people who have been really, really successful. And Howard Zinn is an important guy to go on the web to hear him talk about this. Like, those people who are billionaires and trillionaires, did they work billions and trillions of times harder than you? No. So why isn't there a monetary value for millions and billions and trillions more in quality of life? It's just ridiculous once you just look at the simple math of it. And I think, you know, again, he's, he's really, really doing a high wi wire walk because he's not framing it left or right. He's framing it in we're either human beings who are civilized and want to become more civilized and more human or not. It's, it's, it's dialectic. There is no in-between. You either are committed to the future or you're not in the mind of Thoreau. And every day he's putting himself before his expectations, not others more. He's He's checking himself every day to meet that expectation. So, I mean, it's very rare to see someone uh, practice what they preach. Yeah, the blue shirt back there. You. David? David? Yeah. This is David. Um, and I used to kind of think the way... Speak up. I used to think Thoreau was a great uh, thinker. Can't hear you. I used to think the same way as Thoreau. We returned to nature. And I, I, I uh, lived with my 
my grandparents and dads, it's just this romantic, romantic ideas about life in a small town in East in uh, Central Europe. Until I met somebody, you can comment on this, I met somebody who came from a small town in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And she told me, you have absolutely no privacy. Everybody want, everybody's listening to what you're saying on the phone, they're watching where you're going, and she said, at least in the big city, we have some degree of privacy. Uh, could you comment on that? No privacy in, in uh, a small town. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, privacy. Privacy, I understand. Just trying to find my, uh, here it is, here it is. But here's a guy who told us about privacy in America. <laughs> so the world's going to be like a small town. He didn't sugarcoat it. Edward Snowden said, you don't have any privacy. They decided because there's technology to do mass surveillance that it is democratic. We didn't have an election day to vote on that. It just happened because the government was that powerful. Um, he had to flee the country, land of the free, home of the brave on 4th of July, you know, all the sporting events with the jet fighters going over, the F-35s, the most expensive weapon in history, going over the sports stadiums. But when he tells us what with our taxes and our time and our trust is happening, as opposed to the public relations speeches by a lot of these presidents and prime ministers and chancellors and supreme leaders they actually call them supreme leaders in some countries that's how fundamentalist it is in some parts of planet earth you know it's not just him criticizing the united states government corruption he was criticizing corruption anywhere he found it on earth okay so russia was the last place he wanted his passport to be revoked he was on his way to south america so uh you know he's like throughout he's he's not picking a battle with uh an enemy because he has an axe to grind with one particular party. He's saying the corrupt people shouldn't be in leadership and we the people who work every day should. In the back, way in the back, he was up. Okay. The only in the back. What's your question? Speak, speak up, please. My question has to do with... Louder. Louder. I can hear him. I can hear him. The evolutionist uh, who, um, I guess, right before the Civil War were abolished after, of course, taking his, uh, his word for it, you know, and up making an issue, uh, they just basically felt like President Douglas was about to leave the country when the Civil War started, and everybody was being forced out after John Brown. So, um, can you reflect a little bit more on, on um, the historical aspect? Well, um, you know, John Brown is a very polarizing person in American history. Uh, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. Yeah, uh, if we all met Tom Paine or George Washington today, do you think they would be celebrated or in jail? It depends on who you ask. It depends on who you ask and what their life experiences are. Uh, look not to legislatures and churches for your guidance, nor to any soulless incorporated organizations, but to inspirited or inspired ones. He wrote that in the last days of John Brown. In the plea for John Brown, he said, office seekers and speech makers do not lay an honest egg. I love that quote. As for the herd of newspapers and magazines, I do not know an editor in the country who will deliberately print anything which he knows will ultimately and permanently reduce the number of subscribers. He's talking about ratings in the 1880s, or in the 1800s. They do not believe that it would be expedient. How then can they print the truth? If we do not say pleasant things, they argue, nobody will attend to us. And so they do like some traveling auctioneers who sing an obscene song in order to draw a crowd around them. This quote was perfect for last week, Tim and Charlie. I wish I had remembered this. Uh, here's another one to plea for John Brown, because you know I think John Brown still needs to be re-examined by us nationally. 
I have no doubt that the time will come when they will begin to see him as he was. They have got to conceive of a man of faith and of principle and not a politician, a man who did not wait till he was personally interfered with or thwarted in some harmless business before he gave his life to the cause of the oppressed. He did not recognize unjust human laws, but resisted them. No man in America has ever stood up so persistently and effectively for the dignity of human nature, knowing himself for a man and the equal in any of all governments. In that sense, he was the most American of us all. He needed no babbling lawyer making false issues to defend him. He was more than a match for all the judges that voters or office holders or whatever grade can create. He could not have been tried by a jury of his peers because his peers did not exist. David, right here. All right. Yes, my question is, at what point in his writings did, um, did Thoreau make reference to hoeing beans? Well, he talks about hoeing beans in Walden, you know, right outside the cabin. And it sounds like he loves gardening and he loves farming. And uh, he understands that in order to be uh, self-reliant, he has to farm his own food. Okay. And, uh, you know, urban farming and local farming is something that uh, I'm all for it. We all, we all love to have a garden outside our house instead of a, a bank or a gas station. <laughs> Uh, on civil disobedience, should today, should, do you think we should pay our taxes? Yeah, I mean, we should celebrate tax day as a great day for uh, uh, services and programs that serve our needs. We just shouldn't have Goldman Sachs decide what speech to give us that year to tell us where they're supposedly going to when they don't go to that place, obviously. My mom's a retired operating room nurse. She worked for an operating room nurse for 33 years. She had multiple sclerosis for 18 of those years and crazy schedules. They would have her work a double shift. She'd come home and they'd call her and ask her if she could come back to the hospital after she drove home in the winter in Chicago to work a triple shift because they were understaffed. You know, she still doesn't have single payer health care in the wealthiest, most powerful nation in history. Um, you know, taxes, when you have people, you know, I'm going to go there. If you have people like Bernie Sanders, you know they go to something that you actually wanted them because you needed them to go to that, instead of somebody who knew they were going to make some more money off a of new F-35. Yeah. Over here. Uh, have you heard this uh, story? Have screen. you heard this story, and is it true? Uh, uh, Henry was uh, didn't pay his taxes because he was protesting the Mexican War. Yeah. He was thrown in jail, and Emerson went to see him and said to him, "Henry, why are you here?" Henry said, "Ralph, why aren't you here?" Yeah. Is that true? <laughs> You should be giving this talk. <laughs> um, Emerson understood that we all have different roles to play to make system change happen. So I don't see Emerson as being a counter-evolutionary or a counter-system uh, change uh, person in that moment in time. I think some people got to be on the outside of the center of the fire, so to speak, and some have to be inside. You have to have a defense and an offense in order to overthrow a totalitarian government that is so uh, out of control. You, you, you mentioned the Mexican War. The reason why the Mexican War was happening is because the United States just decided one day that all these territories suddenly weren't Mexico anymore. They were Texas and Arizona and Colorado and Nevada and California and Kansas. It's just laughable. If they had the United Nations then, the United Nations would be like, what are, you, what are you doing? This is, you can't just rewrite the map one day and say, legitimacy, credibility, let's have a parade. You know, it's, it's, it's the Mexican War is another example of how the, uh, the corrupt people who, we the people have the power to peacefully and democratically prevent them from being in government if we just participate. We get the government that we participate. We don't get the government that we deserve. We do get the government we either participate or don't participate in. 
you know, I, I went and hand out College of Complex flyers outside the first day of the World Series last year. I thought there was going to be, you know, in my delusional self usually, I thought there was going to be hundreds of Cubs fans coming to College of at least for one month or two. It's just not on the radar. If, if it's not on the media every single second of every single day, it's out of sight and out of mind. You know, people who live in those parts of the United States don't even realize that's, that's not really legitimate U.S. territory, which, you know, I could have gone there uh, when I had these conversations the last couple months with people said, oh, there's all these illegals voting. Well, if you actually look at the, how the land was acquired, it's actually not illegal for anybody to vote there from these bogus claims because it's actually not constitutionally not their country. <laughs> but again, I'm not going to go there because I don't think there was any voting fraud. Otherwise, it'd be masses of people on trains and buses and cars going right over the border, and that'd be the easiest news story in history. So, the Mexican War is very important to remember the authentic uh, historical action in Howard Zinn's book, People's History, is a wonderful book to get the real take on what happened there. Charlie, you got a question. Okay. Yeah, Jonathan. This, this, your um, your Thoreau, as we he recommends that at most you should only work about six weeks per year. <laughs> now, is that what you think? Do you think that's advice that should be given to young people that they should maybe work for six weeks and say, "Hey, I'm kind of tired of this." I'll see, you know tell their boss, "I'll see you around next year, maybe." You know. I got, I got to, like, I got to go, what was that? I got to go do some sauntering, you know? <laughs> Excellent question. I got to do some sauntering. Excellent question. I'm going to saunter out of here. <laughs> I'm going to saunter for six days and work for two hours on the seventh day. Excellent question. I think he was just like teachers are today. He was saying if we could just get a living wage, I wouldn't be so PO'd. You know, but I mean, when you when you tell teachers who are the center of our communities as to why we have a quality of life that we do, that their paycheck should be less than nothing, you're going to get a lot of employees who are mad at the system and recognize that it's an unjust system. So I think working to him in the way he describes it at that point in time is he's already teaching students, he's tutoring. Uh, he's, he's working hard to build those pencils in the pencil factory. And again, Concord is the publishing capital of North America, at least, probably greater beyond that region at that time in the 1800s. So, I mean, pencils are very important. It'd be like, you know, if you're making computers today. So I think he's talking about working as far as working for the state. He loves to work every day. But he doesn't consider it work because he just he considers a natural extension of democracy. So what he's describing is work there. He could have been more detailed and more thorough in his explanation, so it wouldn't have been uh, so easily misinterpreted. Same thing with taxes. He doesn't mind paying taxes. He wants to pay taxes to a just government, not a criminal government. So I, I agree with you. It's kind of ridiculous to say you only work one day a week. But I think what he's saying is. He's already a glorified volunteer as a teacher on those other six days. So he feels like he is working 365 days, just in a way that the state doesn't recognize monetarily as being worthy of an actual livable occupation. He wrote Give this to Charlie. Pass it down. Pass it back. OK. Shall we, uh, any, any other questions, Jonathan? Let's get in a rebuttal. I don't want one book to be remaining here. Everybody who, who hasn't read Thoreau or forgot what they did, because it's, it's a long read for all, take Thoreau home. And anybody who's a first time college of complexity, just give us your email and take one of those books home and keep it for a couple weeks. Uh, there's lots of books in the back, and I want everybody to take one book home. We're trying to make America read again. <laughs> Let's go on the rebuttals. Uh, how about the uh, yeah, show of hands? How, how many people would like to give a rebuttal? Hold up your hand and keep them up because I'm on a count. Oh, 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 Did I give me one already? Yeah, you did. Oh, oh, oh. Who asked a question who didn't get one of these? Somebody asked a question who didn't get one of these. All right. One, uh, rebuttals. Hold your hands up so I can count. One. Only two over here. Did somebody else have their hand up? Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. 
Jesse. Jesse, how about right. the videos? Can we uh, yeah, check them out back together? Okay. Yes, the videos well, also. They're for, all thorough related. Four minutes related. again. Just leave your email. Bottles. All right. So let's get started. Take Four minutes, right? Was Thoreau a rich man or just spiritual? Okay. Was Thoreau a rich man or just spiritual? He was a Unitarian, so he's very spiritual. He's very religious. He was religious. Yes, he was. He was a unit. He didn't attend church, but he was definitely. He, he, nature was his church. Uh, nature was his church. The, uh, he, he wrote a letter to the Unitarian Church where he was baptized. And some and they had sent him some requests, and he just said, "I am not." Oh, yeah. Please don't solicit. 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 All right, gentlemen and ladies. I'm going to wax a little bit poetic tonight. An ode to capitalism. A system of trust. A system of abundance. A system of choice. A system of consensus. When pressed into service, it makes men's lives better. When ignored under socialist and communistic themes, its in cravings can be odious. When honestly entailed and free of fraud, capitalism is simply the best to make men's lives better. And a little bit about, too, about that pencil factory that uh, I'm quoting now from a famous essay called I Pencil. I Pencil am a complex combination of miracles. A tree, zinc, copper, graphite, and so on. But to these miracles which manifest themselves in nature, even more elementary miracle has been added. The configuration of creative human energies. Millions of tiny know-hows configuring naturally and spontaneously in response to human necessity and desire in the absence of hu any human masterminding. Since only God can make a tree, I insist that only God can make me. Men can no more direct these millions of know-hows to bring me into being then they put molecules together to create a tree. Our, the above is what I am saying. If, I, if you become aware of the miraculousness which I symbolize, you can help save the freedom mankind is so unhappily losing. For if one is aware that these creative know-hows will naturally, yes, automatically arrange themselves into creative and productive patterns in response to human necessity and demand, that is, in the absence of any governmental or any other coercive masterminding, <coughs> that one will possess an absolutely essential ingredient for freedom. A faith in free people. Freedom is impossible without this faith. Since you have a capitalistic society, we have many restaurants where we can choose to eat at. We have many places where we can go to spend our money. And as long as we have that choice, we have freedom. So I applaud free markets, freedom of choice. What if you have no money? Globalists, get a job. Then what freedom do you have? Freedom to starve? Charlie, you have freedom to starve. You have freedom to starve. It's your choice. You can be a bum, or you can go to work and make a little money and have a little more freedom. Thank you. Go, Tim. Okay. Oh boy, Thorium. I was trying to remember the name of that uh, the other day, Thorium. Thorium Energy Alliance. I just want to mention one or two other little interesting things. There's a book uh, by James Lowen, Lies My Teacher Told Me, about, uh, about uh, John Brown. So take a look at that part. Another one is uh, 
okay. first more powerful by Ackerman and Duval about civil disobedience. So take a look at both those. I have to admit here that uh, uh, 60 years ago I was a Catholic, so I'm used to giving confessions. Uh, I didn't read Walden, although I was the book guy at Second Unitarian Church for several years. Walden was there, and I didn't read it. Thank you. Thanks. That's boring. There is, there, is a, there is a God of creation, there is a God who manages our life, and there is God finally help us die. But all these gods, they worship one God, and that God is a whole universe as it exists. And, uh, and when you go as a sort of go in a wilderness and spend time there, and when you are no human being, no other reaction, and all that is there, then you are seeing a real world. And uh, anybody who experiences that, those things, those those kind of crazy experiences, they will have a similar <laughs> feeling in heart and mind. And they will come up with the idea which are different. Uh, when I was young, and I say eight, nine years old, in India, we had absolutely no light, kerosene lamps. And at night there are so many stars, and you look at that and, and you are lost into your thoughts and the stars. And if you go here, uh, Lake Tahoe, you go in a wilderness, and you see, and you have a different feeling, you are by yourself. And, and this is reality, and this happens. But it should be taken for its value. We should not exaggerate that. We should not, I'm pretty, I mean, what do you call it, uh, whatever, you know. The, the thing is that uh, Mr. Thurio said so many things and he believes so many things. But, I mean, let's put, let's put it this way. They are not valid now. We are saying lots of things. And change. We, everybody wants good government forever, for thousands of years. But that, that's not the issue. Issue is, issue is is possible, and it is more possible now. Okay, we have a better life now. We understand cosmos. We understand better than we ever understood before. I think so you may not have any idea what cosmos is that we have today, and that is the, and so so that changes our thinking, how we think, and what reality is. Look, look. I mean, what cosmos has a knowledge, what their rules are by still understanding those rules. The Elon, Elon Musk, he reduced cost of sending a thing to space by 50%. Just like that. The same technology, nothing. So, so things have changed. Government is better. I don't think government is bad. I mean, sure. I, th I think even, even, even um, about this crazy guy, you know, he, he, might have, he might be doing some good also. You know, because I do believe that uh, Soviet Union and we should have peace and that will be better for everybody in the world, including us. Because, because you don't want to, you don't want to get up every morning and have a, and quarrel with other big guy, I mean. I mean, you know, you are right, I mean, you, you want to do everything, everything perfect. But it's not there, I mean, come on, we are more perfect now than we ever had in our life. Okay, we would not even able to stay, come here 50 years back, would you? No, it's a trouble, it's a, you know. So I'm happy, hey, guys. Okay, my time is up, I think. Have we forgotten? We are all a part of nature, not above it. When we've lost this awareness, we've lost ourselves in our civilization. We can always relax and come back and return to our home. 
and find and create peace for all of us. Uh, capitalism has a certain philosophy and the capitalists themselves have a certain philosophy <coughs> and ideology. And it's not that they're born with that, but they're conditioned by their way of life. <coughs> Most of them, I'd say probably 99% of them, are sociopathic. They don't care anything about people. Their whole goal is to make a profit. And if they don't make a profit, they go out of business, or a bigger capitalist comes in and buys them out. So the small fish are swallowed by the big fish. And you cannot change their minds because that is their way of life. And the way of life that you have conditions your thinking patterns. No matter how hard they try, they can't make no sense of not making a profit. So it's not really up to them to change the society we live in, but it's mostly the people they exploit for profit that has to change the system. And there's no two ways about it. There might be a few of them that go into the other camp, but very few. I remember years ago, one of the fields was working for the daily worker. But that is so rare and so exceptional, it's hardly worth a mention. If you want to change people's psychology, you have to change the system that gives rise to their psychology. In other words, you have to do away with capitalism. And that's the only way that you're going to make changes. Look at now what's happening as far as climate change. Very few of them want to do anything about it. And the ones that do, they want to do tokenism. Like the uh, meeting they had in Paris, their objective was really tokenism as far as um, making solar panels, using wood power, and things of that nature. So what they do again is want to make profit, and they have investments in fossil fuels. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions and billions of dollars. And they're not about to give that up for a society that would do away with that type of outlook and conditioning. So all you do is take something cheaper like that. <laughs> I can yeah, seldom we have such an important uh, talk on such uh, deep topics as this. and. Uh, so well and nobly done, and thank you, Jonathan. I paid him. I paid him these, these important um, things to our attention again. Um, Henry David Thoreau was a, a great person and a great thinker, and um, and uh, is not taught as much as he should be. And, uh, a lot of things that I thought I knew, I've been reminded of them tonight. Uh, I find this, uh, uh, you know. The legacy of this person uh, is inciting us uh, to, again, I mean, double down and um, invest more in our efforts to uh, save our democracy and to save our civilization. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, so obvious. Um, I hope it is obvious to everyone else. Um, I, in, during uh, Jonathan's talk, he mentioned that there was uh, kind of a clear and present uh, necessity to um, have mass protests 
after so many have been shown to be treasonous, uh, and many of those that are in our governing um, uh, circle today, however, whether they reached that place illegitimately or um, by the skin of their teeth using the uh, kind of uh, archaic laws. They, um, and uh, the idea that we should protest um, uh, unjust wars, um, which we've had to do uh, in our uh, <coughs> previous, you know, 2003 and, uh, and uh, in the 60s. And, you know, so, so much of uh, Thoreau's uh, um, uh, legacy comes home to us. Uh, today. Um, I was kind of inspired to write a short little poem. It's in the, maybe one of the weakest forms, but uh, um, happy birthday, uh, Henry Thoreau. Your life was an artistic tableau. Your thoughts transcendental and actions monumental show us the path we must go. And that, of course, is the path of civil disobedience. And uh, that brings me again to what I mentioned in my uh, announcement that uh, we have a mass demonstration scheduled for July 15th, a week from today, so appropriately, at uh, noon at Congress in Michigan. Uh, that little semicircle, there's a statue of a horse there. I don't know if Thoreau ever rode horses, but uh, it seems like... I searched. I couldn't find any yeah. him recollecting horse but, Yeah, but uh, uh, marches and uh, walking, did a lot of walking, so hey, uh, two or three hours. This, this, this walk will take you less than an hour probably, although the, the rally might take a little time. Um, if you get there, uh, look for the banner with the no sign of that no will not accept the fascist government in America. And uh, also, um, as Thoreau was a humanitarian and uh, a believer not just in nationalism. Uh, by the way, um, a phrase also occurred to me that uh, uh, if we had more Henry David Thoreaus today and more people that emulated him, uh, that would be a good way to start trying to make America great again. <coughs> In any case, uh, join us uh, for a uh, mass protest and uh, march a week from today, um, Saturday at noon, and uh, we will make the powers that be uh, take notice. So, Congress in Michigan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Dennis Nelson. I would like to thank Jonathan a.k.a. Henry David Thoreau for his informative and inspirational presentation. Anybody who does research on Thoreau will find out that he was born on July 12, 1817. And I can see why Charlie scheduled his uh, birthday celebration for today. And I take a special interest in this evening's program for two reasons. Number one, the importance of Henry David Thoreau's books, articles, essays, journals, and poetry amounting to more than 20 volumes on the world. As one of the tradi original transcendentalists, Thoreau believed that there was much more to life than working feverishly and accumulating wealth. Thoreau's thoughts and words were among the first voices in the wilderness about living simply and compatibly with the natural world. Number two, the influence of Henry David Thoreau on my own life. Thoreau represents America's conservation era of the 19th century. I represent America's environmental era of the 20th and 21st centuries. I've mentioned here before that July 8th is my birthday. And I consider it an honor and a privilege to include this program as a part of my birthday celebration. Happy In birthday, my, Dennis. Thank you. Happy birthday, Dennis. In my 11th grade English class in high school, I read excerpts from Thoreau's monumental work, Walden, 1854. Thoreau wrote, quote, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away, unquote. I was already a nonconformist in my high school. Besides my environmental activism since the 10th grade, I started wearing shorts in the warm spring weather right after the high school abolished its dress code. Thoreau's essay, Civil Disobedience, 
1849 inspired the leaders of protest movements like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. While I have never directly participated in nonviolent civil disobedience, I have served as a support person for those brave and dedicated souls who were arrested for protesting nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons. Now we have seen the climate justice movement using these tactics to protest the Fisk coal-fired power plant here in Chicago, which has since been closed down, the Keystone XL tar sands oil pipeline, and the Dakota Access frac shale oil pipeline. According to the excellent book, Protecting the Planet, Environmental Champions from Conservation to Climate Change, 2016, by Bud Titlow and Mariah Tinger, quote, most important for the issue of climate change are Thoreau's dual beliefs that we can achieve significant changes in cultural and societal mores by passionate, passive resistance and sustainable living in harmony with the natural world. Sometimes it's not the earliest or the most aggressive bird that gets the most worms, but the one that stays most focused on the long-term task of raising healthy chicks, unquote. Two last things about Thoreau being a naturalist. I endorse Henry David Thoreau's idea of, designated, of designating a national squirrel holiday, in other words, a national squirrel day. In his last most important manuscript, The Dispersion of Seeds, Thoreau meticulously noted methods of seed ripening and dispersal, germination and growth of a great many species. Pines, willows, cherries, milkweeds, eight kinds of tick clover, and virtually every other plant known to the neighborhood of Concord, Massachusetts. Thank you very much, and happy birthday to both of us. Yeah. 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 Happy birthday, Dennis. Okay. Mr. Peter Perro. You guys are job killers. That's good. Oh, Charlie. Uh, job maker, if you want to create your own job, is to come to um, Maxwell Street and empty your garage. I, I'm sure Thoreau would be please with the recycling. Maxwell Street is still out there, 105th, talk about a birthday, this summer, 105 years, old Maxwell Street, how many of you have been there with your grandpa or your grandma or your the old Maxwell dad, Street, yeah. the old, well it moved over now, a little bit more east, and it's uh, yeah. closer to uh, Roosevelt Road where the old uh, fire station museum yeah. is, right. where the this is old Aries mm -hmm. cow, you know, supposedly for the barn. So it's still there. There's about 50 uh, vendors. Uh, there's still jazz jams and jazz group, a uh, uh, blues group, and they make the best tacos right on the street. The mama, uh, abuelos, abuelas, uh, grandmas. And, and we put out a book on the history of Maxwell Street. I'll put it in the back. It's mainly photos of the way it used to be with the chicken flickers and uh, shoe shelves and all, all those uh, pub camps. And I'll give you some cards uh, at each table on a do-it-yourself walking tour uh, for, for our birthday, 105 years in Chicago. Maxwell. Was your father a chicken flicker? Isn't the 23rd? Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be there selling. Oh yeah, at Hull House we'll be celebrating too on the 23rd. So once once a month we're still out. And banners, t-shirts, symbols. Let's hear it for Maxwell yeah. Street. I would like to thank Jan for a very interesting and stimulating talk. I hadn't thought much about Thoreau in the 40 years since I graduated from college. But we did read Thoreau, we did read Walton, and we did discuss it. And I'm grateful to you for bringing him back to life in my imagination again. And I, I in my mind again, thank you. I heard a comment from our resident, one of our resident conservatives earlier this evening, which I found kind of annoying. The gentleman in question said, and I quote, well, if all Thoreau did it was talk to the squirrels, was that greatness? Well, that sounds a little bit like Lucy in the Peanuts comic strip when she said, well, Beethoven wasn't so great. He never got his picture on bubble cum cards, did he? <laughs> I'm sorry, I disagree with George. Thoreau was responsible 
for much of what has gone on in the world today, in politics and economics and preservation of the environment. And that's stuff that John rightly pointed out. The only thing that John said that I really take issue with was what he called, when he seemed to indicate that Edward Snowden was a hero. He was not. Now to be sure, he did expose stuff that the U.S. government shouldn't have been doing, and I agree with that. But the trouble is, people forget when they quote Dr. King that one has a moral duty to uh, disobey an unjust law. They only quote part of what he said. What Dr. King also said in virtually the same breath, and I'm old enough as some of you are to remember when Dr. King was an actual human being and actually was living and preaching. Dr. King also said that if you choose to disobey an unjust law, you have to stand up and face the consequences of what you did. And Edward Snowden did not do that. He chose to just flee the country and go off to our biggest adversary. <laughs> now, some people have called him a traitor. I don't go along with that because I don't think that was his idea or his plan. But I do consider Edward Snowden a coward for leaving the country and not facing the music as he properly should have done. And if some of the some of the lefties have a problem with that, hey, you got your views, I got mine. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Charlie. What did you think All about right. Daniel Ellsberg? <laughs> he faced the music. He faced the music. A lot of time and effort. He certainly has a lot of people call them. I think the term would be peripherals. Uh, I don't have much to say tonight. I have to say a few little remarks here since we have a Maxwell Street advocate. Um, I come from, live in uh, close, relatively close proximity to Maxwell Street and have shopped there on many, many occasions when it was in full bloom, so to speak. Uh, it, it was, noted particular for the clothing stores where they had what they call seconds with slightly defects and you could for reasonable price uh, my friend bought a pair of pants and the legs were of two different lengths <laughs> I myself purchased a pair of shoes and I guess you would call them uh, the eyelets, but it had a different number of eyelets on either side. But the shoe, it's made it difficult to tie the shoe, but given the price that I paid, it was... Uh, <laughs> um, yes, and um, let's see what else here. Anyhow. It's a good place to shop. I do go there on occasion uh, and uh, have some groceries that I picked up actually right now. That I'm, But uh, regarding, uh, oh, no, i got to give a totally another topic is I, I spoke here largely on the American Revolution, but I am relatively fond of the area there of Lexington and Concord for its historical uh, relevance and uh, if I could just say that you, you for most people just come to Lexington first where they had the conflict between about 700 British soldiers who marched from Boston and they took on about 70 colonials well needless to say it didn't go too well for the colonials unfortunately I think eight of them were shot and the rest fled the scene. And the British contingent continued marching on. It was short distance away is Concord, Massachusetts. And if I, I hope I, my description can be good enough to do this, but if what happened was the British marched, they, they had no issue uh, uh, in Lexington, but when they got to Concord, things were a little bit different. And it's a little hard to describe, but if you follow a trail, you come onto the bridge. You may have heard about the bridge at Concord. 
And when it's a small little bridge, it's a little creek, when they got over the bridge, there is, it's like a natural bump, like a valley, or a bowl, I would say. And instead of another 70 soldiers, they, the Minutemen, over 3,000 Minutemen had assembled <laughs> in this field. And needless to say, things were a little bit differently at that exchange. I think the British may have taken a shot or so, and then they proceeded to go back again in the direction that they came. Seeing that discretion is a better part of valor. Anyhow, they reversed it and got back into town and almost didn't make it, but when the ads are a little bit different. One last thing we've been talking about here, and we talk about this on multiple occasions at our philosophy group and what we've been covering tonight. I, I must say, I, I met a little variance with Thoreau on his views on government. I was somewhat thinking, though, that protesting the government and speaking about the government, even at, in the late 60s, was not a, a it was, was somewhat discouraged in our culture and was not the thing to do. And I was watching some protesters today, but in the late 60s, if you spoke out, you were accused of treason and things like that. I imagine doing so in 1846 was a pretty risky thing to do, let alone putting it in bread. People are not very accepted to it. Um, and the other thing is, if it's summarized through, we've discussed this many times, uh, most people focus on materialism. And he was talking earlier about giving meaning to your life. And most people fall into the trap of materialism is, is, is they derive meaning in their life from material basis, uh, such as Christmas, where you have this great material ex exchange, or salary, income, is the great measurement of your material wealth. And uh, conversely, the thing that Thoreau and the philosophers emphasize are the intangibles, some, something like truth, beauty, justice, and love. And you can argue this one eat endlessly all night as to whether or not those intangibles in fact exist and are infinitely superior to lives of sheer materialism, which about 98% of the people embrace. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Thank you, and come again, John. Then we got another one. All right. Okay. Um, I just got a few comments. Uh, I think if Thoreau were alive today, you know, he would side first of all with Albert Einstein, who said, you know, remember your humanity and forget the rest. Because the human race is in a race between education and extinction. I'm not sure which side is winning. And uh, all the great writers today are essentially saying the same thing. Uh, David Ray Griffin and Naomi Klein both published uh, two books about a year ago. Griffin's book was Can Civilization Survive the CO2 Crisis? Naomi Klein's book was uh, This Changes Everything. And both of those books are loaded with examples of what people are doing all over the world to combat climate change. Uh, for those of you that might have missed it on the news, uh, Volvo as a company has vowed to make only electric cars by 2020. They're going totally green. Um, so they're getting off fossil fuel. Other companies all over the world are moving toward making electric cars that are fossil fuel, uh, no, convert, you know, no convert, internal combustion engine anymore. The second thing I'd like to mention is everybody is talking about the United States being at war, like a permanent war economy. Well, we haven't been at war with anybody since Vietnam. What we have is our military is waging a controlled slaughter on people that can't really defend themselves. It's like picture a, a picture being told daily that we're, we're watching a, a prize fight, a boxing match between Mike Tyson or George Foreman 
and Mary Tyler Moore or Britney Spears. <laughs> that's not a boxing match. That's a controlled slaughter. And uh, you know, they keep telling uh, our, our the, you know, they want to keep the idea alive. Smedley Butler uh, wrote a book in 1935, Marine General, called War is a Racket. Tom Hartman was talking about this yesterday. Butler said, war exists to make profits for the corporations. Once you take the profits out of war, that's it. We won't have any more war. We're not at war with people for freedom and justice or even protecting the oil pipelines anymore. We're at war ostensibly fighting these terrorists to keep the profit machine going so these companies can sell stuff to the military at 100, 200, 500, 1,000 percent more profit per pair of shoes or clothes or belts or whatever it is than you sell peacetime through Target or Kmart or Walmart. That's what the uh, current war economy is. Another myth, many writers today, many, many writers are saying the human race has no future, we're not going to make any progress until we face the reality and puncture the myth of 9-11 that was created on 9-11. 9-11 is a total fairy tale, a myth. It's the greatest fraud, real estate fraud in broad daylight. Seven buildings were packed with explosives and demolished by an explosive team, and the builder took out billions of dollars worth of terrorist insurance so that he wouldn't have to pay for the demolition of his own buildings. Not only did he have to pay for the demolition or the cleanup, he got billions of dollars for building something new on the site. Until we face that reality, the mist of 9-11 is driving homeland security. The term homeland, incidentally, comes straight out of Nazi Germany, for those of you that didn't know that. Everything bad happening in America in these billionaire predators, billionaire predator criminals that are being appointed by Trump to run our government, it all stems from the myth of 9-11 and that we got this permanent war economy facing Islamic terrorists all over the world. There is no large group of terrorists. That, that is also a myth. So the last thing I would want to say, there's a tons of books that are talking about how fast the world is going green. Today, solar panels are cheaper than buying fossil fuel uh, electricity from ComEd. Out, out where I live, Palatine, Arlington, there's roofs that are being covered with solar panels now. The cost of photovoltaics has dropped over 90% in the last 10 years. What used to cost $1,800 for 300 watts, $1,800 worth 20 years ago is less than $100 worth for the same electrical output today, from 1800 to 100, like cheap cell phones, DVD players. So uh, Volvo and other companies are you know, going to be mass producing electric cars. Uh, I work with a JV coach. Uh, he, he, he backs his car into the garage and charges it right off the roof. We're teaching seventh graders out in Arlington that you can drive a solar powered car today. And it's not in the future, it's here now. But we have to do something about what our media, our media is maintaining people in a bubble of ignorance. And we have to combat that. And I think Thoreau would be front and center of combating the media generated ignorance if he was here today. Thank you all and thank our speaker again for all right. All right. the performance tonight and you have the last word. The role was a communist. The role was a communist. He was a socialist. He was a socialist. Six weeks. I like that. Six weeks a year. That's all you need to do. Uh, this gentleman uh, in this picture riding this horse in the Illinois prairies, you can't see the buffalo, but they're there. This is in Batavia, Fermi Lab. That's my father, Henry Barton Jr. And uh, he went to study physics at the University of Illinois, but also the University of uh, Philadelphia in the 60s. Uh, at the same time that uh, a very outspoken and rarely principled uh, young professor of linguistics was attending the University of Philadelphia. And I never spoke to my dad whether he saw Noam, but they were there at the same time. And uh, being that Noam's from Massachusetts, I want to read something. Uh, 
he's kind of the father of the world. So I want to pay tribute to my late father, Henry Barton Jr., and our still with us father of humanity at its best, Noam Chomsky. Uh, this is from Walden. I should not forget that during my last winter at the pond, there was another welcome visitor who at one time came through the village through snow and rain and darkness till he saw my lamp through the trees and shared with me some long winter evenings. One of the last of the philosophers. I think that he must be the man of the most faith of any alive. His words and attitude always suppose a better state of things than others are acquainted with. And he will be the last one to be disappointed as the ages revolve. He has no venture in the present. But though comparatively disregarded now, when his day comes, laws unsuspected by most will take effect, and families and rulers will come to him for advice. A true friend of humanity, almost the only friend of human progress, an old mortality, say rather an immortality, with unwearied patience and faith, making plain the image engraven in our bodies, the God of whom they are but defaced and leaning monuments. With his hospitable intellect, he embraces children, beggars, insane, and scholars, and entertains the thought of all, adding to it commonly some breadth and eloquence. I think that he should keep a caravan Surrey on the world's highway, where philosophers of all nations might put up, and on his sign should be printed, entertainment for humanity, but not for our beast. Enter ye that have leisure and a quiet mind who earnestly seek the right road. He is perhaps the sanest man and has the fewest crochets of any I chance to know. The same yesterday and tomorrow of yore we have sauntered and talked and effectively put the world behind us, for he was pledged to no institution and a freeborn ingenious. Uh, on this 200th birthday this Wednesday of Henry David Thoreau, uh, we remember someone who wasn't afraid to be a human being. Uh, 200 year birthday of Henry David Thoreau. And we celebrate a Henry David Thoreau who we don't have to wonder what would he say, what would he do, how would he live. He's right here with us. Disobey the dream limit. Imagine someday a Noam Chomsky president. And then we've got a real we the people evolution that can't be stopped by any billionaire on earth. <laughs> you complexity collisions. Happy birthday, Henry David Thoreau. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Andy, okay, with that, the College of Complexes in the night is adjourned. We will see you all next week. Thank you. Nice hat, Andy. How you doing, Henry?